you so much. It's an honor to be here, and I thank the uh, coordinators for sending me an invitation to come. Uh, it's also exciting to be in the place where isoprene chemistry was asked again about whether or not it would make SOA from Brazilian uh, campaigns that were done in the early 2000s. So um, this is the group that's been actually doing most of the work that I'm going to present today, and I feel like I should acknowledge them before I get into the details of my talk. Um, so uh, particularly, I'm going to be presenting work from Dr. Ing Xuan Lin, uh, Theron Riedel, and uh, Shri Hapsari Bodhisulis Tiorini. Um, so uh, th these folks, that's Sari, Ing Xuan, here, and Theron. And uh, we've also been collaborating with uh, Joel Thornton's group and uh, Faye McNeil for modeling and my SOAS collaborators and, of course, uh, funding. So this is our current picture of what we think uh, or how SOA formation occurs from isoprene oxidation. So once isoprene is emitted from the surface, we know that the primary uh, reaction pathway is through the hydroxyl radical chemistry. And so once we make the initial peroxy radical, really the fate of this radical dictates the type of SOA that you're going to get uh, from isoprene. So in particular, the level of nitrogen oxides that are present in the atmosphere. So if you have high NO, you'll go through the methacrylene pathway pathway where it will further oxidize to give you pan. And we've shown through some laboratory studies and uh, uh, modeling that uh, you can get methacrylic acid epoxide. And then that goes on to make some of these known aerosol phase tracers. So everything that you see boxed in the aerosol bubble are compounds we detect both in the laboratory and also in field samples throughout the southeastern United States. And then if we're more in a lower NO regime, we know that the uh, peroxy radical chemistry uh, through Paul Wimberg's uh, group's work uh, goes on to make the isoprene epoxy diols, and they can reactively uptake into wet acidic aerosols as well to make other known uh, uh, compounds such as where the two methyl tetrols, which were discovered in Brazil. And more recently, uh, Matt Elrod's group has shown that uh, you can actually make hydroxynitrates in the gas phase that will actually react and make some fraction of uh, isoprene epoxy diols. Although that's sort of our current understanding of the uh, SOA formation from epoxides, um, we still have a number of questions we're trying to address. Uh, in particular, are there other unknown compounds besides those tracer compounds that I showed on the previous slide, such as maybe brown carbon constituents, for example, that are forming, and if so, how? Also, we're, we're still unclear about the exact environmental conditions that lead to SOA formation from the uptake of these epoxides in the southeastern US. And we're also wanting to know more about the spatial and temporal variations of this type of SOA throughout the southeastern US region. And also questions we're also looking at in my lab as well as in the community is what are the exact kinetics of the reactive uptake of these epoxides? And more recently, my, my group's also been trying to do exposures of the SOA we generate in the lab to human lung cells to look at the potential health effects of this aerosol. But in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on the first four questions. I'm attempting to do a lot in 20 minutes. Um, so this is our approach right now, is we're, we're really relying on organic synthesis to make these epoxides and then use that cap tip, uh, capability in our field studies, flow tube studies, and smog chambers, and using mass spectrometry, we hope that we can better derive the parameterizations that we need to improve the atmospheric modeling of SOA formation from isoprene. So um, I first wanted to start off talking about other types of SOA constituents, such as brown carbon, that might be forming from this chemistry. And so this is a figure from Rodney Weber's group that showed in Yorkville, Georgia, where you have very little influences sometimes of no biomass burning, as well as very little elemental carbon, that the total fraction of the light absorption can be coming from brown carbon. And interestingly, they showed that if you extract the samples with methanol, they see more brown carbon constituents. And what's unique about Yorkville is it's kind of a rural site, and we've actually made field measurements there. And we've shown that the IUPOX chemistry really dominates there. And we, we see about 20% of the total OM being from this chemistry, just for those known tracer compounds. But when we saw this paper, we really became interested in it and really wanted to re-ask the question, can we make brown carbon through the IUPOX uh, particle phase chemistry? So we wanted to do some more chamber experiments under various conditions of aerosol composition 
precipitation, seed, uh, seed aerosol acidity, and also uh, relative humidity. And so this is using our indoor chamber. We inject different seed aerosols into the indoor chamber. We then introduce the uh, gas phase synthetic epoxide. And in this study, we, we focused on the trans-beta I-epox isomer because uh, recent work, again, from Paul Wimberg's group showed that this is the predominant isomer that's formed in the gas phase. And then once the aerosols and the, of course, the epoxides interact, we get aerosol growth, especially in the acidic cases. Um, and then we get these aerosol constituents that we've seen before. And then we collect the aerosol for offline chemical analysis using a suite of you know, offline GCMS, LCMS, and other techniques. So we did a lot of experiments in the last year and a half and trying to re look into this in more detail. And we usually injected the same amount of seed aerosol into the chamber, about 300 ppb in the uh, Viapox into the chamber, just to really push on the chemistry. And what we found is that in the dry acidified magnesium sulfate case, we actually could start producing visibly brown carbon on that filter, but all the other filters that we collected, even though they had higher aerosol mass loadings that were being produced, uh, made this brown carbon. And we were very interested about this. And this also seemed to suggest that the brown carbon that's forming may be cutting off uh, the uptake of further IAPOX molecules to grow the aerosol mass. And so Limbeck et al. actually showed in the early 2000s that pure isoprene can make uh, brown carbon and then, you know, that could be a potential contribution to HULIS and atmospheric aerosols. So we wanted to go after this but one thing I wanted to point out in terms of why this was occurring, we, we thought that maybe because of the modeled acidity in these experiments was the lowest for this case, this dry acidified magnesium sulfate aerosol experiment. So we then used UV-Vis to look at the, uh, the absorption properties of the aerosols and of course, you know, corresponding to all that brown that you saw in the filter, we saw a lot of absorption in the near UV visible range. And we took the approach that uh, Sergei and his Gordoff's group at UC Irvine has done in terms of calculating the mass absorption coefficient. And um, so what we found, of course, is that the acidified case uh, had the largest MAC value. And this MAC value is similar to what Sergei's group has seen for other biogenic SOA types where they've exposed ammonia. And so the the thing I want to stress that is in our magnesium sulfate case, we're not using any nitrogen in the system. So there's no uh, influence of that chemistry here. So we did LCMS uh, separation, and our LC is coupled to a diode array detector. So as we do the chromatography, the reverse phase chromatography in this case, we're also getting the uh, absorption uh, uh, tick or total ion chromatogram here. So essentially what you see here is in the early eluding areas here, we see compounds. Um, there you go. Compounds that we found that are very uh, fully saturated, there's no unsaturation in them, so they're basically polyols, and they don't have any uh, light absorption. But in this later region, we find that there's actually more light absorption uh, in the spectrum. And we're using positive uh, electrospray ionization mass spectrometry to detect some of this. But what you notice is in the positive ion mode, we're not seeing everything that looks to be absorbing in the diode array detector. But these compounds tell us something about maybe what's going on in the aerosol phase. And what we're finding is, is that if we do tandem mass spectrometry, for example, so if we take this uh, 569 uh, compound and do tandem mass spectrometry, we can build the structure and we were doing accurate mass measurements. So we're fairly confident in these assignments of the molecules. But what we began to see is that the double bond equivalents in these oligomers that were forming at later retention times uh, were becoming more unsaturated. And so this may go on further to other more unsaturated compounds that we're not being able to really observe with electrospray ionization. Um, and so that asked, the, that begged the question for us, do we see these types of oligomers in the atmospheric aerosol samples? So this table is not to, meant to, to go wild. We did a lot of identification here. But what the trend is showing is, is that early in the chromatography where we have more water-soluble organics eluding, we have very little double bond equivalents. But later in the chromatography, we have more uh, compounds, larger oligomers that are more unsaturated. And what we found that was kind of exciting is then when we went back to Yorkville and measured the aerosol samples with the same technique, we were beginning to see uh, the oligomers building and actually coming off the, uh, the, the column. And you can see the C20, the C30, the up to C40. And there are definitely the bond equivalence is uh, increasing. And these peaks are quite broad, we think, because the, there might be branching and other things going on in terms of the uh, polymerization. 
And so we've been trying to think about what a possible mechanism is for this chemistry. And so what we think happens is you start off with the fully, uh, the, the polyols, and as, as they age in the aerosol phase uh, through high acidity, you do cyclodehydration. And eventually you can start doing this further enough that you can get these um, more unsaturated compounds. And so we, we're not exactly sure if it's purely due to acidity or if it's the magnesium sulfate aerosol, because under dry conditions, magnesium sulfate doesn't deliquesce. So it's more like a gel. And so what might be happening is that it was allowing for better coordination of these molecules to do the dehydration of the ether linkages in these large oligomers. So we've also done field sampling, and we've been wanting to look at the spatial and abundance of these uh, isoprene-derived SOA through the epoxide chemistry. And it looks like a, a MAC issue here. Sorry about that. So we've done a lot of uh, field sampling throughout the southeastern U.S. region. We've published data from Jefferson Street, which is in downtown Atlanta, also Yorkville data, and I didn't want to present stuff that we've already published today. So I was going to focus on some new results that I'm kind of excited about from Look Rock, uh, which is here near the Great Smoky Mountains. And so at Look Rock, uh, Karina McKinney's group brought a PTRMS, and we were able to measure uh, VOCs that were emitted. And so what we noticed very quickly, of course, and as we kind of expected uh, based on the land coverage, is that the uh, VOCs emissions will be dominated by isoprene. And so here I'm showing you the diurnal averages of isoprene and methyl vinyl ketone and methacrylene, and here's alpha pinene emissions that we could, or uh, mixing ratios that we measured with the uh, PTRMS. And then here I'm showing you ACSM organic data overlaid with what we think are signatures in our uh, uh, SIMS th th uh, measuring epoxides. And we have standards that we've been using to try to quantify this data to, to better understand this. So we also looked at the uh, ACS and data in more detail. So we were really interested in knowing where the organic was coming from. And so this is what you would expect. Most of you have made measurements with an AMS or a type of AMS instrument. So, um, and then we, we had size, size, uh, sizing information at this site. And we were pleased to see that the ACSM uh, mass versus the volume data from the DMA uh, were pretty well correlated. So we performed PMF uh, on the organic fraction to see what we would resolve from the organics. And so we've See, we saw factors in the PMF that we were not surprised to see in uh, biogenic dominated areas. So we saw what we think is called the isoprene factor or IEPOX OA factor. Uh, and we've seen this previously in Atlanta uh, in pretty high abundance. Um, we saw LVOA and of course we saw this 91 factor and uh, many groups in the Amazon uh, have seen this factor and it's a little bit unclear on where this is coming from. I know others have seen it like John Abbott and the uh, Canadian areas as well. So um, we also did ME2 just to check the PMF. Um, it's just a hybrid of CMB and PMF, really. And we're working up these results. But what we found that was interesting is there wasn't really a diurnal variation in the IAPOC signal, but we're sitting on a mountaintop, and so we're trying to work through uh, the complexities of that to better understand this. Whereas in Atlanta, we actually saw a more of a diurnal profile uh, in the IAPOC factor. But it's striking because when you look at this, it's about a third of the mass uh, at Lubrock we think. So we also correlated uh, the IAPOX OA PMF factor with uh, uh, aerosol tracers that we measured from PM 2.5 samples we collected at Lookrock. And so here I'm showing you uh, a lot of the GCMS tracers that we have for the epoxide chemistry. And we find that there's a very good correlation. And what you'll notice as well is that the tracers can be in fairly high abundance. And so we actually synthesized a lot of the isoprene aerosol tracers so we had more confidence in the quantification with the GCMS. Uh, we're lacking organosulfate standards still, so we had to use surrogates, but we also saw quite a bit of an abundance of these compounds, we think, and also they're very well correlated with the online aerosol mass spec data. And so I wanted to do this comparison because, as many of you know, filters tend to have a bad rep, and so we wanted to do this online mass spec, offline mass spec comparison. But these tracers that we have from the laboratory, you know, really we found they only account for about 30 to 50 percent of the total IAPOX OA factor mass. So there's something there that's missing. Uh, and maybe this factor isn't all IAPOX chemistry. It could be mixed. Um, or these oligomers that we're seeing and then the brown carbon study could also be part of the mass. But we don't have standards to really quantify those oligomers yet. So it's very difficult to, to get mass closure on this. So we're, we're still thinking about this. And I'm not sure where I am on time, but I wanted to quickly show some things on our kinetic studies using flow tubes. So um, we've been using acetate and iodide sims to look at this with uh, Joel Thornton. 
And so in our lab, we did our, some, some of our own inflow tubes experiments first, where we basically we have a one meter length, eight centimeter di inner diameter, and we do the halo carbon wax to help prevent uh, losses as much as we can. And so typically what you do is you fill the flow tube with aerosol, you have a movable injector. This is again using techniques by Joel and others. And we coupled this to our SIMS and our DMA to probe this kinetics. So at time zero, essentially you have this stable signal of the Oxide. I'm showing May here. I apologize. I should have made that more uh, non non explicit. And then we can move it up to adjust the interaction time with the aerosol, and then we would see the signal drop, of course, in the SIMS. And then we can use uh, our kinetic fits to this data. Um, and we do this. We do the flow tube experiments at different lengths as well, without the seed aerosol, to know what the wall losses are of these epoxides in the flow tube. So we do it with and without aerosols, and then we can get the K het once we know the wall loss. And the K total is the particles with the epoxide. And so that's how we can get that. And so from this uh, data, we've actually done this for the magnesium sulfate plus sulfuric acid experiments. We, um, we derived uh, uh, a gamma of about 0.0126, and this is diffusion corrected. Um, we also, um, again, take into account uh, the, the losses to the wall. So this was pretty interesting for us. So what we wanted to do with this flow tube data was actually go back and see if we could model our prior chamber studies with the reactive uptake of these epoxides on seed aerosols of our choice. And in this case, we, used, we went back to some of our older experiments with magnesium sulfate and sulfuric acid. Uh, and so what we do is we account for wall losses of the epoxide in the chamber. So we run separate chamber control experiments to know what the wall losses of both the epoxide and the aerosols are. We take that into account. And you can see with the gamma we derive from our flow tube studies, we can fit the data fairly well. But the knob you have to turn in this, is, of course, is what is the SOA yield? So we still have to take that into account. So that was the main knob we turned. And by turning this knob, we found that about 3.5% is what we would need. We're currently working with Havila Pai at EPA in the US and Faye McNeil at Columbia on modeling uh, the explicit products that are forming in the aerosol phase. Uh, sorry, my PhD student's working with them on this now. And we're doing this for our SOAS look rock field data as well. OK, I see I have one minute. Thank you. And so very quickly, I just wanted to go through some work that we did with Cassie and Joel's group. Uh, so here we looked at ammonium bisulfate and ammonium sulfate. And you can see with the ammonium bisulfate, we see the loss. Um, we, we fit this data. We did this for a number of pHs. We fit this data with a resistor model. And we used a Henry's Law constant of 1.7 e to the eighth. And we used the parameters from the bulk solution studies that Paul Weinberg's group has done. And we fit this pretty well. We also want to look at the effect of coatings, so organic coatings. So uh, Cassie, I have to give credit to her on this. She decided that PEG would be a good surrogate to try. Uh, and what we did find is that the uptake coefficients were certainly lower due to this probably core, uh, uh, core shell morphology. And real quickly, I just wanted to show from these experiments, we were able to sort of map out acidity versus the total surface area of aerosol and the pH uh, to sort of look at lifetimes. And so we found from this work that we think that for uh, aerosol acidity is less than one in the atmosphere, you can have uh, lifetimes of about five hours. And so at Look Rock, we actually had an aerosol acidity is less than one many times throughout the campaign. And I've heard at Centerville it was pretty low as well. So this could be really relevant, especially since the lifetimes against OH and deposition uh, appear to be a little bit longer. And so with that, uh, it appears that the IEPOX derived SOA throughout the southeastern US region is a pretty dominant source of aerosol, about a third. We see these brown carbon oligomers, but we don't know how important they are to radiative forcing, especially when there's no biomass burning because we can't quantify them quite yet. And again, we looked at the gamma as a function of composition of aerosol, acidity, and relative humidity. And it definitely seems that acidity is the most controlling factor uh, in the uptake of these epoxides. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. Hello. I was just wondering if you have done the same experiments in the um, flow tube reactor as a function of the concentration. Do you have an aging effect? Yes, so we have done that. and. Um, 
we also have to worry about lifetime as well. So we're going to start looking at changing the interaction times throughout the flow too. But uh, we are we have looked at different surface uh, aerosol surface areas, if that's what you mean. And uh, we're planning to publish a subsequent paper on that. But I didn't have time to show all that data. But I'm happy to talk with you about some of the details if you want to know more. I know we're crunched on time. Sorry. And the second one, what is PEG? What was that? The PEG. You were saying that you have coated your particles with PEG. Oh. Uh, polyethylene glycol. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So, is it Steve, last question. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. That was a real tour de force kind of talk. Um, the brown carbon correlations uh, with your IEPOX tracer, have you looked at any of Rodney Weber's data to see how well that actually correlates with the infield data for the IEPOX tracer? Very good question. We want to do that. I'm still waiting to hear back from Rodney on this. We, we will do this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.